Hi there, 5th and 6th graders and anybody else who'd care to join us. We're going to start doing some reading lessons that look a little more like something we might be doing in the classroom. Don't worry, I picked a really great book. It's called My Side of the Mountain. My 6th grade teacher read this to us when I was in 6th grade and I have never forgotten it. It's a wonderful book. But before we do that, we're going to take some notes. So I need you to grab a piece of paper and something to write with. So you can pause this and I'll wait right here for you. Oh, you're back. Okay. Well, let's get busy then. This is sort of like half of your sheet of paper because I'm using it long ways. But you have your two holes at the top and then your one in the middle. And then across the top, you have a long line like that. And this is where you usually write your name. Okay. So right underneath that, go down about four or five lines. And I want you to draw a short line. I'm going to straighten mine out a little bit. Make it a little flatter. And then we're going to go slowly uphill. And then we're going to come down just a little bit faster. Think of this as a ski slope. Go up slow one side, but come down faster on the other. And then a short flat line at the end. Now, up here in the top part, we're going to give our notes a title. This is called Plot Line. Every story has a plot line. And we are going to learn about the plot line for our story. First thing we're going to do is we're going to put a 1 right there at the beginning. A 2 right down here where the line goes and then starts to go up. Put a 3 on the uphill. Put a four at the very top of the hill. Put a five on the downside. And then a six at the bottom. Okay. So I'll go down a line or two and write number one. And we are going to write the word exposition. Let's think about that. Exposition. X po si shun exposition and underneath that e put a dot and under that dot put a dot next to the first dot we're going to write the word characters C-H-A-R-A-C-T-E-R-S, characters. And underneath that, we're going to write setting. S-E-T-T-I-N-G. Now, by 5th and 6th grade, we should know what the characters are and we should know what the setting is. But just to sum it up very simply, these are the people in the story and then this is where it happens. We're going to read the first chapter, which is the exposition. It may be more than one, it might only be one. We won't know until we read it. Underneath this video, there is a comment section. I would like for you to put in that comment section the names of the characters and the setting if we get told that in the first chapter. Before we start reading, let's take a look at our book. This says that it's a Newberry Honor book. Does anybody know what that means? If you do, I want you to put it in the comment section below. And look very carefully at that cover. 
Who is the author? If you know that author's name, I want you to put it in the comment section below. And anybody answering my questions in the comments, comment section, I promise you're going to get a shout out in the next video. So, let's head towards that first chapter. Before we get there, though, we find this map. It looks like a very detailed map of the side of the mountain that we're going to learn more about. We'll probably need to come back to this page at some point in time. Something else just occurred to me. That's a very nicely drawn picture. So that must mean there's somebody drawing pictures in this book. Even that one you can tell is a drawn picture and not a photographed picture. I wonder who the illustrator is. If you figure that out, Please put it down below in the comment section. Next page. Contents. This is our page of contents. That tells us everything that's in the book and the page number we can find it on. If you would like to read the author's preface on your own, you may. But I'm going to go right to this page where it starts at my side of the mountain. And the very first chapter starts on page three. So you follow along while I read. I may throw out some words that I need some definitions to. So if you know what the definition is to the words that I throw out at you, then please put them below. First chapter, in which I hole up in a snowstorm. I am on my mountain in a tree home that people have passed without ever knowing that I am here. The house is a hemlock tree six feet in diameter and must be as old as the mountain itself. I came upon it last summer and dug and burned it out until I made a snug cave in the tree that I now call home. My bed is on the right as you enter and is made of ash slats and covered in deer skin, with deer skin. On the left is a small fireplace about knee high. It is of clay and stones. It has a chimney that leads the smoke out through a knot hole. I chipped out three other knot holes to let fresh hair in. The air coming in is bitter cold. It must be below zero outside. And yet I can sit here inside my tree and write with bare hands. The fire is small too. It doesn't take much fire to warm this tree room. It is the 4th of December, I think. It may be the 5th. I'm not sure because I have not recently counted the notches in the aspen pole that is my calendar. I have just been just too busy gathering nuts and berries. Sorry, they're sticking together. Smoking venison, fish, and small game to keep up with the exact date. The lamp I'm writing by is deer fat poured into a turtle shell with a strip of my old city trousers for a wick. It snowed all day yesterday and today. I have not been outside since the storm began, and I am bored for the first time since I ran away from home eight months ago to live on the land. I am well and healthy. The food is good. Sometimes I eat turtle soup, and I know how to make acorn pancakes. I keep my supplies in the wall of the tree in wooden pockets that I chopped myself. Every time I have looked at those pockets during the last two days, I have felt just like a squirrel, which reminds me, I didn't see a squirrel one whole day before that storm began. I guess they are holed up and eating their stored nuts too. I wonder if the baron... That's the wild weasel who lives behind the big boulder to the north of my tree is also denned up. 
Well, anyway, I think the storm is dying down because the tree is not crying so much. When the wind really blows, the whole tree moans right down to the roots, which is where I am. Tomorrow, I hope, the Baron and I can tunnel out into the sunlight. I wonder if I should dig the snow. But that would mean I would have to put it somewhere, and the only place to put it is in my nice snug tree. Maybe I can pack it with my hands as I go. I've always dug into the snow from the top, never up from under. The Baron must dig up from under the snow. I wonder where he puts what he digs. Well, I guess I'll know in the morning. When I wrote that last winter, I was scared and thought maybe I'd never get out of the tree. I had been scared for two days, ever since the first blizzard hit the Catskills Mountains. When I came up to the sunlight, which I did by simply poking my head into the soft snow and standing up, I laughed at my dark fears. Everything was white, clean, and shining and beautiful. The sky was blue, blue, blue. The hemlock grove was laced with snow. The meadow was smooth and white, and the gorge was sparkling with ice. It was so beautiful and peaceful that I laughed out loud. I guess I laughed because my first snowstorm was over, and it had not been so terrible after all. Then I shouted, I did it! My voice never got very far. It was hushed by the tons of snow. I looked for signs from the barren weasel. His footsteps were all over the boulder, bo excuse me, boulder. Also, slides where he had played. He must have been up for hours enjoying the new snow. Inspired by his fun, I poked my head into my tree and whistled. Frightful, my trained falcon flew to my fist and we jumped and slid down the mountain, making big holes and trenches as we went. It was good to be whistling and carefree again because I was sure scared by the coming of that storm. I know you have that picture in front of you, but look at it closely. Just the way they drew it, doesn't it look kind of scary? I had been working since May, learning how to make a fire with flint and steel, finding what plants I could eat, how to trap animals and catch fish. All this so that when the curtain of blizzard struck at the Catskills, I could crawl inside my tree and be comfortably warm and have plenty to eat. During the summer and fall, I had thought about the coming of winter. However, on that third day of December, when the sky blackened, the temperature dropped, and the first flakes swirled around me, I must admit that I wanted to run back to New York. Even the first night that I spent out in the woods, when I couldn't get the fire started, was not as frightening as the snowstorm that gathered behind the gorge and mushroomed up over my mountain. I was smoking tree trout. It was nine o'clock in the morning. I was busy keeping the flames low so they would not leap up and burn the fish. As I worked, it occurred to me that it was awfully dark for that hour of the morning. Frightful was leashed to her tree stub. She seemed restless and pulled at her tethers. Then I realized that the forest was dead quiet. Even the woodpeckers that had been tapping around me all morning were silent. The squirrels were nowhere to be seen. The juncos, the chickadees, and nuthatches were gone. I looked to see what the barren weasel was doing. He was not around. I looked up. From my tree, you can see the gorge beyond the meadow. 
white water pours between the black wet boulders and cascades into the valley below. The water that day was as dark as the rocks. Only the sound told me it was still falling. Above the darkness stood another darkness, the clouds of winter, black and fearsome. They looked as wild as the winds that were bringing them. I grew sick with fright. I knew I had enough food. I knew everything was going to be perfectly all right, but knowing that didn't help. I was scared. I stamped out the fire and pocketed the fish. I tried to whistle for frightful, but couldn't purse my shaking lips tight enough to get out anything but So I grabbed her by the hide straps that are attached to her legs and we dove through the deerskin door into my room in the tree. I put Frightful on the bedpost and curled up in a ball on the bed. I thought about New York and the noise and the lights and how a snowstorm always seemed very friendly there. I thought about our apartment too. At that moment it seemed bright and lighted and warm. I had to keep saying to myself, there were 11 of us in it, dad, mother, four sisters, four brothers, and me, and not one of us liked it, except perhaps little Nina, who was too young to know. Dad didn't like it even a little bit. He had been a sailor once, but when I was born, he gave up the sea and worked on the docks in New York. Dad didn't like the land. He liked the sea, wet and big and endless. Sometimes he would tell me about great-grandfather Gribbley, who owned land in the Catskill Mountains and felled the trees and built a home and plowed the land, only to discover that he wanted to be a sailor. The farm failed, and great-grandfather Gribbley went to sea. As I lay with my face buried in the sweet, greasy smell of my deerskin, I could hear Dad's voice saying, that land is still in the family's name. Somewhere in the Catskills is an old beach with the name Gribbley carved on it. It marks the northern boundary of Gribbley's Folly. The land is no place for a Gribbley. The, no, the land is no place for a Gribbley, I said. The land is no place for, for a Gribbley. And here I am, 300 feet from the beach with Gribbley carved on it. I fell asleep at that point, and when I awoke, I was hungry. I cracked some walnuts, got down the acorn flour I had pounded, and with a bit of ash to remove the bite, reached out the door for a little snow and stirred up some acorn pancakes. I cooked them on top of a tin can and as I ate them, smothered with blueberry jam, I knew that the land was just the right place for a gribbly. And that's where we're going to stop. I didn't give you any vocabulary this time because I wanted you to get used to the rhythm of my voice. And I wanted you to develop... A picture in your mind of what he's possibly going through. We've learned that he is from New York, but that is not the setting of this story. So don't forget, below in the comment section, write down the characters and the setting. So far, we only have three true characters. Do you know who they are? We'll talk about it next time. See you then.